Hello, and welcome to ESG Talk, your go-to source for insights and advice from leaders in environment, social, and governance. I'm your host, Mandy McReynolds. Today, I'm joined by Bob Eccles, the world's foremost authorities on integrated reporting and sustainable business. In addition to being an award-winning author, Bob is currently a visiting professor of management practice at Said Business School at the University of Oxford and was previously a tenure professor at Harvard. Bob, thank you so much for joining the show. Hi, Mandy. How are you doing? All right. Well, let's dig right into it for our audience. In a recent article for the Harvard Business Review, you and a co-author, Allison Taylor, discussed how the role of the chief sustainability officer is changing. You wrote, historically, CISOs have acted almost like PR executives. However, some CISOs are currently spearheading integration of material ESG, environment, social, and governance issues into corporate strategy. Can you elaborate on this and tell us what is really driving this shift in the role? So maybe, maybe I can start by talking about uh, Animal Farm. Did you, did you read the book? Animal I did. Farm? <laughs> Do you remember Animal Farm? So in Animal Farm, all animals are equal, except some animals are more equal than others. And that's kind of what the story had been to for chief sustainability officers for many years. They were on the farm, uh, but they were an unequal animal. And to continue the imagery and mix metaphors a little bit, you had the C-suite, the CEO and the CFO sitting on the top floor, and they had grand offices and great views and big budgets. And the CSO was kind of down there in the boiler room with a little office, and they begged to get one and a half FTE so they could publish an annual sustainability report. And there was this kind of nuclear detente between the CEO and the CSO, where it's another metaphor. The CSO didn't ask for too much in terms of resources, and um, the CEO didn't trash sustainability. Uh, and in fact, for a long time, it wasn't called sustainability. It was called corporate social responsibility. And I think that that was well-meaning, but it was also indicative that it was kind of a sideshow. It's like, okay, here's the company and it's doing the work with uh, more equal animals and it's making money. And then you've got a CSO to make sure that it's not doing any really bad things to make sure kind of people in the neighborhood like you. And for a long time, that was really what the role of the CSO was. It was a lot of stakeholder engagement. And I'm not demeaning the stakeholder engagement. I think it's important, but it really wasn't core to what was going on in the business. And, and that was indicated by the disconnect between sustainability reporting and financial reporting. And although I joked about a little bit, relatively limited resources. And I think in a lot of cases, you still see that to be the case that the CSO had. So that was kind of life for a long time. And, and then it changed. And what's interesting about it is it's changed and it's changing rapidly in certain industries. And I'll get into that over the past couple of years. And the way this whole thing came about, my friend who's a senior editor at HBR, Evan Harrell, comes along and he says, well, you know, we're kind of looking for some articles. So, so we went out and we interviewed, I think it was 26 CSOs and 32, 33 asset managers. And it was interesting because in my work, you know, I'm, I'm pretty well connected in the investment community, asset owners and asset managers and public equity and private equity. I'm chair of KKR, Sustainability Expert Advisory Council. I didn't tend to move in the CSO world all that much, you know, because a lot of my work is, is more in reporting. I mean, kind of on the sustainability reporting, you know, a little bit more with CFOs. And so I interviewed a bunch of CSOs. And it was interesting because they were in a range of industries and in a range of countries. And, and what we found was this evolution in the role over the past couple of years. And I think it's being driven by a couple of things. And some of the stuff is more global and some of the stuff is more U.S. specific. I think on a global basis, what you saw was the International Sustainability Standards Board get set up by the IFRS Foundation a couple of years ago. And I think it was in June they issued their two standards. There was, you know, IFRS S1, general requirements, and S2 on climate. And you had the Green Deal with the EU taxonomy and the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group sets up the Sustainability Reporting Board to set up European Sustainability Reporting Standards, all these acronyms. So you had the ISSB coming out with a set of standards, which they can't require. They're a standard set or not a jurisdiction. So countries would have to mandate the use of ISSB. But the EU is a, is a political you know, entity. And so it has said that you know, all companies in Europe doing business in Europe above a pretty low threshold have to report according to the CSRD. So that raises the game big time for sustainability reporting. So just like you've got financial reporting, a set of standards, 
and you have assurance on them and the EU is asking for assurance and it was going to be the same thing with sustainability reporting. So I think that's one thing. I think a second thing is that there's been a lot of talk about you know how sustainability can contribute to corporate performance, but it's mostly been sort of good feelings. And I don't think it's been you know substantially demonstrated in a lot of cases by companies. And they'll have a few token slides in their capital markets day and their quarterly calls, but they were starting to feel like, okay, we need to be able to make the case for how sustainability contributes to financial performance. Just like, you know, companies have to make the case for mergers and acquisitions, for going into new markets, for R&D investments. And so I think that would be a second factor. And then all of that coming together led to people recognizing that the CSO role needed to be more important, but for it to be more important, it had to change. It had to change in terms of resources. It had to change in terms of capabilities. Uh, and it had to change in terms of the types of people that it's got in that role. And it had to change in terms of how it thinks about materiality. And then there's concomitant changes that have to happen on the CFO side. So it's just like if the CSOs need to become fluent in financial talk so that they can you know, demonstrate the relationship between sustainability and financial performance, and the CFOs have to do so as well. Bob, I love that you are such a great storyteller. And the background and context about the evolving role of the chief sustainability officer and chief financial officer. You also wrote that investor interest in sustainability has elevated CISOs and tied the role more closely to CFOs. Let's take a moment and educate our audience on how you've seen investor interest elevate the roles. And there you see again over the past couple of years, it's very interesting, this evolution where just like there's the lesser equal animals in the corporate side, Animal Farm applies to the asset manager side where the most equal animals were the portfolio managers and they were the boys and girls that got paid a lot of money and they got to make, you know, portfolio allocation decisions and pick stocks and short stocks and do whatever they want to do. Then you had the less equal animals in the kind of ESG and the stewardship group when they did the proxy voting. For a long time, there was absolutely no engagement by the people that were in the stewardship group, let's call it, and the company. And just like there wasn't much engagement. And if there was, it was kind of like a tick the box thing. The same thing with the CSOs. Then what you started to see is the CSOs talking not only to the stewardship people, but talking to the portfolio managers. And just like the CFOs need to raise their game and the portfolio managers need to raise their game because they need to take a point of view on what they think the material issues are. And you go from these conversations where you have the sustainability person talking to the CSO. And it's like this ticks the box exercise. Do you do TCFD reporting? Or are you a member of PRI? You know, da, 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 da. well, it wouldn't be PRI, it's Global Compact. And there's probably nothing of that in that conversation that goes over to the portfolio manager. That That is starting to change, right? So historically, CSOs have not engaged with investors and they didn't know how to talk to investors. And so what you see when I said in terms of the role is changing, so there's some CSOs that have kind of developed over time. And, uh, and I think they've done a great job at that. In other cases, what you see is that it's very interesting, and this is a signal of how uh, the CSO role is sort of becoming like one of the equal animals. They're coming out of investor relations. They're coming out of product development. They're coming out of R&D. You know, they're coming out of operations. They're coming out of procurement. They're coming out of functions that would be regarded as much more core to what the company does than, you know, historically the way people talked about corporate social responsibility. Now, one implication of that and Allison and I have some snarky things to say about materiality matrices, as you probably know from reading our piece. It's like the everything is material matrix. And I'm like, huh? You got 20 things in the top right-hand corner, and these are all, quote, material? It's wonderful to see companies are embracing a new sort of CISO role. But I want to drill down into what you said about materiality. You're right. Not everything can be material. Building on that, sometimes we have to make hard choices. Another part of your article that I enjoyed and it stood out to me is the notion of trade-offs. Can you define the concept of trade-offs in the context of sustainability for our audience? You know, people have kind of limited capacity. They have limited bandwidth. How many things can you pay attention to? So probably in my youth, I'm a smart guy. I went to MIT, got a PhD at Harvard, a smart boy. Yeah, probably in my prime, I could pay attention to seven things and make trade-offs on seven things. Years go by, I'm 72, some cigars, some whiskey later, maybe maybe I can do five on a good day, maybe it's three. But that's about it. 
right? Because there's trade-offs. There's trade-offs between environmental stuff. There's trade-offs you know, between environmental and social things. And so what we're arguing for in our piece and what we're seeing happening in these companies is to have much greater discipline and say, what are the three to five material issues that are really existentially important? I love that that summary real quick. And I, you know, I think you talk about in this article, the four major changes to the CISO role. And so to summarize for our audience, it's really looking at the right people in the role, looking at the right resources, determining what's material, and then this evolution of how how the CFO role and the CISO role should work in tandem together. And I want to take for a moment for our audience and dig a little deeper with you, the trade-offs that exist, these conflicts of interest between stakeholders among environment, social, and governance issues. Can you give us one really strong example of a trade-off? Mining is an interesting example because you need to license to operate to get into a community, you know, so that you can dig, you know, the minerals. In doing so, you know, you are creating jobs, but you're also creating carbon emissions and you're creating potential problems with the water table and so forth. And so one could say, well, we are going to slow down the rate at which we're, you know, opening new mines. So we're going to slow down the production process. And so we're going to need fewer people. So that's going to be fewer jobs that are created. And I think often what you find in the generic case is that there's things that you can do that will have kind of positive environmental benefits, but they can be at a cost of jobs, right? So people that are coal miners, you just can't flip a switch and all of a sudden say that you're going to work in renewable energy. And so um, that would be an example of that. And kind of more generally in terms of how to think about this, I think the key thing, the way you assess materiality is, does the issue rise to the level of importance that it fits into the capital allocation process? You know, is it something that it's a significant enough amount of money and it's capital, not just a cost? And you're needing to think about, you know, what is the time frame in which you're making this investment, you know, and how do you think about what the benefits are going to be? And historically, there's been really no relationship at all between the sustainability function and strategy and capital allocation, you know, at the corporate headquarters. And building on that capital allocation, I think if our, our listeners want to see an example, you can look at the Workiva ESG impact report on page 11, where we look at then what's the relevancy to our stakeholders. So changing it from that traditional, all dots are equal, not all dots are equal. There may be more relevance to a different group of stakeholders and beginning to demonstrate that visually. Also demonstrating what's considered a risk, or which could be capital allocation, what's considered the cost to your business, that capital allocation, to what are the opportunities? Because there, to some industries, there can be revenue generating activities, that it becomes a more applicable place for that component. Here's another interesting example, you know, when you think about it in terms of mining. So everybody's like all excited about the energy transition as they should be and getting away from internal combustion engines. And we're going to get into electric cars and all that stuff. So many people can afford them. But you need, you know, minerals and rares to do that. And so a mining company that is expanding its production, its carbon footprint is going up, right? So it's creating jobs. So there's no trade-off and its carbon footprint is going up. But then when you've got these whole kind of net zero targets and stuff that people are supposed to set and trying to use carbon emissions as a proxy for transition risk, it doesn't always make sense, right? Because if you think about a mining company, it's probably a good sign for its future stock price that its carbon emissions are going up. I mean, it should do it in a responsible way and blah, 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 all the things we know about. But, you know, it's contributing to the energy transition, the way things are measured. It's not getting credit for the reduced emissions by having more electric cars and not having internal combustion engines. But if you just look at the company itself and it'll be getting pressure from NGOs, its carbon footprint is going up. And as we look at that dynamic, what's interesting in your article is you really push into this idea that the CFO and CISO need to have a strategic relationship. You go as far to say maybe the CISO should report to the CFO. So so as we think about these two groups working together, how do you think they could work together on global regulation to drive an impact for both business and society forward? So you're right. I mean, I, I think that the CFO, in the, in the case of PMI, Jenny reports to um, Manuel Bebo, the CFO. So 
I think that's a really good reporting relationship. And I think the CEO can be fine, but it's better to have a strong relationship with the CFO involved in capital allocation than a token relationship, reporting relationship to the CSO or the CEO, I'm sorry, where they meet one or two times a year. The question going back to the standards. So the standards, companies can give input into regulation, but any one company's input is just any one company's input. So they're basically takers of regulation. Companies aren't makers of regulation. So I think what's important is that companies are very aware of the standards that are being developed, have been developed by the ISSB and by FRAG in the ESRS. And and I find a lot of them are really behind the curve on this because these things are coming and they're coming very quickly. And so this is where the CFO and the CSO need to work closely together because right now the CSO will have more the content language of what these things are that are going to be, these standards are being applied to. But the quality of internal control and measurement systems, and this is the kind of stuff you guys get into, the quality of these need to be raised by at least an order of magnitude. So you've got internal control and measurement systems and internal audit that's the same level of quality that you do with your financial reporting. And that's really in the bailiwick of the CFO. And so it raises this interesting question of does the responsibility for creating the report shift over from the CSO, which has historically been the case with the CFO not having his or her fingerprints on it at all, to the finance function is responsible for implementing these standards and having the systems and preparing the reports. And then it's, you know, the CSO in conjunction with the CFO who explain, you know, what these sustainability performance results mean and how they're connected to financial performance. And I think that's because, again, things are moving quickly. How that's going to sort out over time, we'll see. But somebody's budget's going to have to get bigger, whether it's the CFO or the CSO implementing. These standards are, are not going to be cheap. You know, and there'll be an investment up front that will be cheaper over time through technology and all that. Uh, but that's, you know, staring right ahead of us. Yeah, and I think as people formulate their task force, we're seeing changes. Our, our task force is chaired by our CFO. Our, and we're seeing even in voluntary regulation, even voluntary practices, not regulatory practices, the CDP, for example, more CFOs signed off than it's been the CEO in the past or the chief sustainability officer as the highest officer signing off. And we're seeing a shift and a trend to it being the CFO. So we're watching still how how the different elements come to play, but our team is already doing together with finance, legal, and the ESG team coming together, looking at gap analysis together. We're walking through together assurance and audit of our emissions and scaling to our other parts of our ESG reporting. And it's a collaborative effort across these three teams, because to your point, you need all players at the table working together together as we move forward. I think you had a really interesting note where you said, you know, if someone's hoping to become a CISO one day listening, um, they're going to have to start engaging executives and board members more. So what do you think is the one essential skill that a CISO five years from now is going to have to have? So I think that's, that's the answer to that is, is pretty simple. They need to have much deeper knowledge of the industry that they're operating in and the company strategy in that industry. The degree of knowledge that CSOs need to have of the industry, the competitive dynamics, what the competitors are doing, what the regulatory forces are, um, you know, what their strategy is, how they distinctly stand out, you know, what are their competitive strengths, what are their competitive weaknesses. That I think will really be the core skill that future CSOs need to have. And if they don't have that, you know, then they're not going to be qualified to be a CSO. And that's why it's interesting and you see a signal of that. Because the people that are going into this function, investor relations, R&D, you know, procurement, product development, um, those functions have been, in the, you know, varies a little bit by industry, but those are much closer to the kind of core business model of the company than being the CSR department those are over here on the side taking care of stakeholders. I love that direction for our audience. Well, Bob, thank you so much for helping us unpack these four core areas thinking about how those listening in can have the right resources, prepare to be the right person in the role, seek to think about materiality differently and stakeholder engagement differently, and finally look at for that collaboration with a CFO or the future of the CFO and CISO being very well tied together. You did a much nicer job of summarizing <laughs> the piece of my article than I did. So, so thanks for the clarification. That was good fun. Nice talking to you. Take care.
To our audience, thank you all for joining us for another episode of ESG Talk, brought to you by Workiva, the world's only unified platform for financial reporting, ESG, audit, and risk. If you're interested in hearing from some chief sustainability officers themselves, I invite you to scroll through recent episodes of ESG Talk. This season, we've heard from a dynamic group of CISOs at several global organizations, including Nike, Honeywell, and AT&T. And as always, if you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to see future episodes on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. We'll talk soon.